So uh, first of all, if there's anything that you want to ask me, please interrupt. I mean, we're economists, so we're tend to be impolite, so you can be, <laughs> can be impolite to me too, it's not a problem. Uh, this is work with Theo Alexandratos here, so you know, obviously all mistakes are you with him. Uh, how does this talk connect to the session? Basically to Elizabeth's interesting talk. Well, what I'm going to say here is deeply unpopular, both in Greece and in Germany. So maybe it's showing that you cannot have a referendum about any of these things if you want to have an AMU. I mean, you have a choice either to have an AMU or to have democracy. You cannot have both. <laughs> okay. well, very interesting position. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so currency areas, so there has been a very nice work by uh, Robert Mondell. He got the 99 Nobel Prize for it. And uh, basically what he said is that you need capital mobility, so capital needs to be able to go around easily in this area. And labor needs to be mobile, so workers need to be moving from a place that uh, they find no job to a place where they have a job. And you need the business cycles in the different countries to be similar, okay, right, in the different regions. Uh, now, there is a geographic area where the people move around all the time. There are no restrictions from the state on the movement of capital, and wages are definitely not sticky. And that's Somalia. Uh, but, so the question is, is Somalia really an optimal currency area? No, okay? So you also need a state. You need a state that has broad powers to do things, and that can guarantee political stability, that contracts are enforced, things like that. And you also need institutions, which is what uh, other speakers are mentioning. And the idea is that the state needs to be able to use the central institutions to allocate common resources where there's a need for them. Okay? You also, also need risk sharing systems, so a system for fiscal transfers when you have shocks in different regions. Okay? So is the Eurozone an optimal currency area? Capital mobility is guaranteed, so it's easy to transfer money from one country to the other. Labor mobility, no. So labor mobility is uh, it's quite, it's quite low in Europe, and that's because Europeans tend to be very... <laughs> we are the proof here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Except for us, uh, Europeans are not very mobile. Uh, similar business cycles, yeah, so we, we checked some data, and apparently business cycles were more aligned in Europe in the last decade than in America in a long part of its history. Okay? Uh, the, the major question here is, is labor mobility and business cycles, are these exogenous things? It's similar to the question, is there European demos? Well, it depends, you know, if you create a European state, maybe there will be one, okay? Same thing here, if, if the states are really tightly connected with each other, if it's easy to move from one to the other, then maybe people will move more, okay? Uh, centralized institutions, that's again, not, not my business to, to say how it works exactly, but I would say they're not enough, okay? What are the common institutions in the Eurozone? Well, you have the European Commission, uh, you have the budget, it's allocating European money, its budget is tiny. Okay, with uh, comparison to any other major, inter major organization, major, I don't want to say state, but a major federation, something like that, uh, the European Commission can only have 1.27% of GDP, and in practice always around 1%. And this is, of course, is a problem because this is influenced by people who are not in the Eurozone, in particular, of those countries, okay? Uh, there are some good examples of spending euros. Uh, there's a community support framework that the uh, Greeks know as the Kinotika Plesia Stages. And uh, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, that's debatable. You have the European Research Council, which I love. So it's taking money and allocating the best universities in Europe, which is a great idea. Right? You have Frontex and other institutions like that. You have a couple of really bad examples, like the Common Agriculture Policy, that at some point was like 50% of the European Commission's budget and was just taking money and throwing it to, to garbage again. Uh, so you have these mountains of butter and rivers of wine that were all due to this policy. Uh, you have other examples that are a bit weird. So you have like, you know, people going from Strasbourg to Brussels and back all the time just because the French and the Germans couldn't agree where the capital of the European Union should be. Uh, and you have some common institutions that are definitely missing when you compare it to other similar areas. Okay? So there's no army, which is debatable if you need it or not, but importantly, there's no common social security system. Okay? Again, because I tend to speak fast, if there's anything you want to ask, please shoot. Uh, now the question is, is there any optimal currency area on this planet? Okay, so the theory is good, but how do other countries or federations make it? And basically, is there any that is not uh, negligible, is not tiny, okay? So, for example, is London an optimal currency area? I would say, according to the theory, no. 
you have huge inequalities, different people make very different uh, wages in London and they're influenced by shocks in a very different way. Okay? Uh, what about China? It's a huge country, okay? They have one currency. Uh, labor mobility is very low in China because of this hukou system. So basically, people from a village cannot go and move to Shanghai and live forever. They don't have full rights, they're really second class citizens. Uh, capital is somehow mobile, less than in Europe, again, because of many restrictions. But of course, the Chinese state is huge, it's very centralized and very powerful, okay? So they allocate resources across China very easily. What about the US? It is arguably the most successful currency area up to now. Labor mobility is very high in the US. So a typical person with their 30 would have lived in four states, which is really unlike. Yeah, Sorry, you're really yes, And do you think there's any difference between England and the rest of Europe? Because I have the impression that here in England the, the mobility is quite high. But it's when high. When you say Europe, high. Europe, you including England or Britain? I do. So I, think, I don't think it's too high. Because maybe okay. you make people move from London to Nottingham, but they don't go to Germany. So, so you're talking about... I'm thinking about states in America. So people go from California to Washington State and then to Massachusetts and then, you know, they don't have any problem switching states. Europeans have a problem going from one town to another. And I think it's a common thing in, in all of you. Except in, you know, most of the people here. Uh, okay. Uh, what about the economic cycles? They are not necessarily more synchronized. So there are places like Michigan in America that, you know, as the auto industry is collapsing, you know, there are cities that lose half the population. Uh, and their the economy is basically collapsing while California was booming or Texas is booming, okay? But what's saving Americans is that then people will move from one town to the other. While in Europe it's not really always the case. Okay? So here's a bit about the history of the United States. So it took them, some economists argue, 150 years to become an optimal currency area, okay? So it started in 1788, you had shocks in the agricultural sectors and the financial sectors in a region, and they were aggravated by monetary construction. contractions were caused by a loss of reserves. It's basically very similar to what's happening in the Eurozone now. So you have one shock in one region, and then because you just have one central bank, this thing is aggravated. You don't have flexibility to deal with shocks. Okay? And the uncertainty about the future of the Union at the time made things worse exactly as, as it does in Europe. So if you're not sure you will have the same currency in five years, then all kinds of things do not work. Investment doesn't work so well, you know. Transfers, lending doesn't work so well. Okay? And, and it, it's argued that some states would have been better off in several episodes in that history. They had their own currency, but in the end, they're still in the same union, okay? And this was holding basically until the 1930s, when America started being much more centralized. And the common central bank, it had much more fiscal transfers, uh, more social security and stuff like that that were centralized, okay? Okay, so here's a question. Why doesn't Alabama leave, leave the dollar area? Um, so besides the obvious political reasons that the federal army will invade and just make them stay in the union, uh, well, they have access to stable and very liquid markets from which they can borrow to fund all kinds of things, investment, construction, and consumption, okay? So, you know, a guy in Alabama does not look for banks only in Alabama. He will try to get a loan anywhere in America, especially with online banking, okay? Of course, there's no exchange rate risk with its big trading partners, which is probably, I don't know, but it's probably Massachusetts and California and everyone, you know, so many of the other states, okay? So, if the people you're trading with a lot, they have a different currency, you're always afraid that this currency might depreciate, appreciate and causes all kinds of trouble. Then another thing that they have is the Fed, the central bank in America, which guarantees many things that are useful for Alabama. And they also have the FDIC, which is the Federal Deposit Insurance uh, Corporation, okay, which is basically saying that any deposit in Alabama is guaranteed by the federal state, unlike in Europe. That's why some Greeks are afraid that they might lose their money because we don't have a guarantee like that in Europe. Okay, and uh, apparently here, here's a number: the federal government in America gives 40 cents to a state for every dollar it is used, losing in a recession. And that's not an active policy; they do it on purpose. It's basically. When GDP is going down, unemployment goes up, things like that uh, might go up, so you have this automatic stabilizer. So the, f the federal government is paying for people's unemployment money or something like that. Okay? That's why they run a big debt. Though. Excuse me? That's why they run a very big debt. America as a whole. Yeah. yeah. So, so, although the states cannot have a debt. That's a crucial difference. So individual states cannot have a debt. Okay? And then there are economies of scale. So Alabama bonds would be probably worth less than Greek bonds if it was alone in the markets. Okay? The more important question is, why doesn't New York leave the dollar area? 
Okay, so for Alabama, it's kind of obvious where it should stay. Uh, well, for New York, the same thing. How, what would Wall Street be without America? Definitely not what it is now. Okay, so its institutions have access to much bigger markets where you can borrow and lend. Okay, they take the savings of people in Massachusetts and then they lend them to people in Alabama, for example. Okay, it's just helpful to be in a big currency area, even if you're a strong state. Obviously, again, there's no exchange rate risk, so it's really useful for people who live in New York to trade with people in California. And again, you have economies of scale. So even New York bonds would not be very valuable uh, if New York was alone in the markets, okay? So it's definitely true that the United States are much more credit worthy than a, a single state, even if it's New York. <coughs> okay? Now, I would like to say some more things about central banks. It's a very special sort of player, and I think they're being underestimated in most uh, conversations about the EMU and Europe in general. So this, the single strongest player in this, in this continent is the ECB. Okay, I'm, I'm pretty sure about that. Um, what does the ECB do? So what, what does the Fed do in America? Well, it guarantees liquidity in the market. So it says whenever you have any shock, any problems, then the Fed will come in and will just give liquidity. Here's an anecdote. Uh, I left the US about three years ago. And when I came back now, well, I go back all the time, but I came back to my old house and I got a pile of letters like that. And I was looking at my letters and I was getting proposals to get the credit card. In the beginning, they were offering me three months of no interest. Then it was six, then it was 10. Now they offer me 18 months of no interest, no, no payments of interest. Why is that? Because the Fed is giving plenty of money to banks. And that's what we don't have in Europe. Even in England, which again, okay, it's outside the EMU, there's a problem. So there's not so, so much liquidity. You cannot get this, these terms of lending. Okay? And this is a disaster for the economy if you cannot have it. Okay? Uh, like I said, then you have the FDIC that guarantees deposits. And these two institutions together guarantee that you don't have bank runs. So basically, people are never afraid they will lose their money if they keep it in a bank. Okay? Uh, the Fed also implicitly promises to always accept federal bonds as collateral. So what it says is, there's no default in America. There's no way that if you buy federal bonds, you will lose your money in dollars. Okay? You might lose it in another currency because the dollar might, might fall. Okay? But the, the idea is that as long as you are in America and you don't care about the exchange rates, too much that you cannot lose your money. Okay, that's really really important. Well, the eurozone, we don't have any of these things. So we don't have a pan-European deposit guarantee. We don't have eurozone bonds, and even on, on top of that, there are European Union or eurozone members that are lent that whose bonds basically are not accepted at face value at the ECB. Greece, for example. So, if you have a Greek bond and you want to give to the ECB to get money, you only get about fifty percent. Okay. And this means that bank runs are really possible in Europe. And that's what's happening in Greece. Okay? So these are deposits by domestic residents in Greece, and you see that they are always rising. Okay? So there's always a tendency for them to rise, even if the economy is not doing too well, they should be rising. But here, around the start of the crisis, there's a collapse. Okay? Greece has lost 70 billion uh, euro. Okay? That's a huge amount of money. It's very hard for an economy to lose so much money and continue functioning well. Okay? So, you know, some people, especially in Germany, would argue, well, some members are just too weak and they shouldn't be in the EMU anyway with us. Uh, and they would say, you know, look at their deficit. They have crazy trade deficits and the inflation is horrible and everything. And they would say there's a big asymmetry. Well, here's a question, okay? Is only a Germany clone a country that should be in a currency area with Germany? No, that wouldn't make sense. I mean, you, you know, like I said, in America you have Alabama and New York. You don't have only New York, so only Alabama, okay? Um, so here's a figure that might have seen a lot. Can I, can I interrupt? Sure, but, uh, you're using the thing, the thing to be a culture union in, in, in saying that. Uh, if it wasn't for the federal state and the Fed, Alabama and Michigan and California would not be an open currency area. Right, so it's in not, like have, I said, you need the well, institutions. Yes, yeah. so, so the fact that, you know, the fact remains that if we don't have the political institutions that make a sub open currency area optimal, uh, then it is only the clones of Germany that should go with Germany, and that's consistent with Mandel, and that's why he got the Nobel Prize. That's debatable. So that's what Mandel would say. I, I would say it's debatable. I'm not sure we have time to talk about this, but it, I, I would say it's debatable. So it's, I'm not saying no. But the point in the OCA, OCA literature is either you have synchronicity or you have a political union, fiscal union. More or less, yeah. Mm -hmm. So here's something, but here there are some details that people say that these countries are asymmetric, and I think they're wrong about this, but really wrong. So people say, look at trade deficits, okay? Some, sometime around 2000, we have the introduction of the euro, 
Germany is not, oh, the colors are completely wrong here, so you cannot tell which country is which. This is Germany, okay? So Germany had a big trade surplus. All the other countries basically had a deficit. And if you look at it, if you, this shouldn't be pigs here, but again. Um, <laughs> I don't like this term, I really don't like it. So if you have all these countries of the south, including France, and basically the periphery, because Ireland is there too, and you add their deficits, they basically correspond to the German surplus. Okay, so people might say, wow, there's a huge asymmetry here. And this is a sign that this country shouldn't be together. I completely disagree with that. Trade deficits are not always bad, contrary to what people tell you. So um, trade deficits can be good. So what happened in the Eurozone was that up to 2010, there was a lot of interbank lending. So banks in Germany would lend to banks in Greece. Banks in France might lend to banks in Greece. Okay? So there was a lot of capital going to the periphery. And that made sense, OK? It's, it's good if capital is going from countries that have a lot of it to countries that don't have too much. OK? Uh, now, by having an identity, when you have capital going to a country, this country must have a trade deficit. It's not a theory, it's just an accounting fact. It cannot be any other way. Okay? So this means that from the moment that Greece and Spain were having money going from Germany to them, they would have a trade deficit. It's not a sign of weakness, it's just a sign of money going in. Okay? It's a fact. It cannot be in any other way. But there is, there can be the opposite of that, right? I mean, it could be. You receive the money because you have a trade deficit. It could be. So I'm not claiming that a trade deficit is never bad. I'm saying it's not, this, it's not an index of anything without looking at other data. You can have a trade deficit and be a super healthy company, like the US has done for a long time. Uh, here's a mechanism of basically pretty obvious that banks borrow abroad, then they give money for investment, consumption, jobs are created, and this makes demand for foreign goods go up. And basically, this means that the trade deficit will, will, uh, will be the result of this. Uh, now, large fiscal deficits are usually bad. That's a major difference here. So people are mixing two types of deficits. Governments often borrow to finance consumption, consumption, not investment. Right? And they don't do it in a smart way. They do it in a very myopic way. So especially in Greece or in countries like that, a government just cares for the next three years or four years maximum. Okay? So basically, they take money, give it to the people, and just spend it or waste it. They also, government debt, debt is used as a store of value. So if bonds are not repaid, private wealth falls, banks collapse. It's a really bad thing. If, a country defaults. It's not a big problem if the corporation or if citizens don't pay back their whole debt, but if a country doesn't, it's a huge problem. Okay? It causes uncertainty and it causes many, many problems like the ones we see now in Greece. Um, I have a very fast model. If I can have one and a half minutes, I can explain. Do I have one and a half? Okay. 90 seconds? <laughs> can we go back to the previous slide? So actually, if. Um the seconds are gone. Oh. <laughs> For example, if you were... Uh, what if I finish this and then... Yeah, yeah. Okay. So here's a plan that we call asymmetry, okay? It's a world filled with people like, uh, you know, basically home economics. So very rational people with perfect foresight. They can see the future and anticipate it. And you don't have crazy governments messing things up. Okay? And then assume you have two, two kinds of the same population. They're just divided by a river. And they don't have boats or anything. So they don't trade with each other. And for some reason, country A in the end has more capital than country B. Okay, just assume this is the start of the world. And then you, you build a bridge and you call it the European Monetary uh, Union. Okay, what happens then? Well, the country that has a lot of capital will start lending money to the capital to the doesn't have too much capital. It's just because investment opportunities are better where capital is scarce. Okay, what else happens? Well, if you look at the graph, you basically have that capital is basically relatively is going down in the country that has a lot of it and is going up in the country that has less of it until they converge, okay? And this is their, their GDP basically. Practically they also converge, okay? So GDP will come close. And here's the current account. This is the major thing I want to show you here. You have this explosion, like I said before. So country B, the one that didn't have much capital, will just have a, a huge trade deficit, okay? Which at some point will, will be reversed, okay? But this is the, be the beginning of the story. And let me just focus on these early years. That's what you get, okay? Current accounts explode, and you have this symmetric uh, thing that the one country has a big surplus, the other has a big deficit. Okay, there was nothing unreasonable here. Don't say that anyone is stupid, nobody's crazy, nobody's lazy, nothing of the sort, okay? Just this. And if you just look at what happened in the, in the Eurozone, it's the same thing, okay? These are the deficits. I would claim that we just ended the AMG too early. That would be my claim, okay? And that's it for me.